Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome uh, to UCSF. My name is Dan Doan. I'm one of the co-directors of the UCSF UC Hastings Consortium on Law, Science, and Health Policy, and we're really delighted to see you all here this afternoon. For about the last uh, eight years, uh, each early summer, uh, the consortium has presented a panel where uh, experts from UC Hastings and from health policy realms come and talk about what's been going on with the Supreme Court um, in the last year, and this began uh, when the court was reviewing the Affordable Care Act. And we've continued that tradition, and this year we have a bit of a twist on it. We're doing it a little bit later in the year, and we're, uh, I think we're gonna end up talking about the court, but we're also gonna be talking about some other topics. So uh, for this event, we are live streaming and recording what's going on, so it would be great if, when we get to the question and answer part, uh, you can hold your questions until you have a microphone so we can record your questions and ensure that our audience listening in and watching in at home is able to follow along. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Jamie King to introduce our speakers and again, uh, welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Jamie King and as Dan said, uh, I am the, also the co-director of the UCSF UC Hastings Consortium. We're so excited you're here today. We think we have um, a fantastic topic that I know has been on the minds of all Americans, and we have two incredibly wonderful professors from UC Hastings here to talk to you about the ins and outs of the Mueller investigation. And so this is our twist on it for this year. We may have another event later on talking about the court and the Kavanaugh um, candidacy for the court and things like that, and we'll, we'll definitely keep you updated on all that's happening there. But for this year, we thought this was a very special opportunity to talk about the Mueller investigation and everything that's been going on. Um, so for our panel today, we have Professor Hadar Aviram, who is the Thomas Miller Professor of Law at UC Hastings. Her expertise includes constitutional law, criminal justice, and criminology. She completed an MA in criminology at Hebrew University in Jerusalem and received her PhD from UC Berkeley's Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program, where she studied as a Fulbright Fellow and a Regents Intern. An award-winning teacher and scholar, Professor Avaram's research focuses on criminal justice and examines policing, courtroom practices, and corrections through a social science perspective, specifically using quantitative, qualitative, and experimental methodologies. Professor Avaram's award-winning book, Cheap on Crime, Recession-Era Politics and the Transformation of American Punishment, analyzes the impact of the financial crisis on the American correctional landscape. Her forthcoming book, Yesterday's Monsters, examines the, the Manson family parole hearings. Professor Avaram's most recent projects and publications analyze the impact of the financial crisis on the American correctional landscape and on California corrections in particular. She served as the president of the Western Society on Criminology and runs the California Correction, Correctional Crisis blog. She is one of the leading voices in the state against mass incarceration and is a frequent media commentator on politics, immigration, criminal justice, civil rights, and the Trump administration. And so Professor Avram is gonna talk to us a little bit about what are, what are the allegations, what, is, what do we know has happened, what are, the, what are the indictments in this case so far, and then talk about um, grand juries, what are the criminal procedure and proceedings that are gonna be happening um, in the criminal space on this. And then next up is Professor Joel Paul. He is the Albertson Abramson Professor of Law at UC Hastings. And Professor Paul is a constitutional, constitutional and international law expert who has argued a number of First Amendment cases before the US Supreme Court, testified before Congress, drafted federal trade legislation, and served as an advisor to the Clinton presidential campaign. Professor Paul has taught on the law faculties of UC Berkeley, Yale, Leiden University, oh, Leiden, University of Connecticut, and, the Ameri and American University on subjects ranging from constitutional law to international business transactions, international trade law and policy, global inequalities, national security, and foreign relations law. His most recent book, Unlikely Allies, or his first book, Unlikely Allies, How a Merchant, a Playwright, and a Spy Saved the American Revolution, um, was recently out and is a fascinating read if any of you are interested in uh, history. And his second book with Penguin Random House is Without Precedent, How John Marshall Invented American Diplomacy. And it is also a fantastic read. In his spare time, which I can't believe he has any, Professor Paul writes stage plays and screenplays. 
Um, Professor Paul is going to talk to us also. Um, he's going to take take over from Professor Avram and tell us a little bit about what the powers of the president are. What can he do? Can he pardon himself? What are the powers that the um, that the investigation has over him? And and basically, what are the constitutional issues at play? What are the balance of powers issues at play? So I'm not going to talk about this anymore because I am clearly not the expert. But I'm going to turn it over to them uh, for what I know will be a very fascinating discussion. Thank you all for coming. Uh, in trying to prepare this presentation, I have spent many hours getting acquainted with all kinds of shady characters, Russian oligarchs, and, and all kinds of dealers and wheelers, and, and the story is becoming very complicated. I think I have managed to condense this to a story that tells you basically what happened without oversimplifying what's going on and highlighting a few of the key players. Uh, so that's what I did. In this presentation, I also took pains to only present things that we at this point know as fact, rather than things that we speculate about. And and the speculations I'm going to leave to you for, uh, for later. So the first thing to keep in mind with the Mueller investigation is that there's not only just one investigation into the Russia involvement in the 2016 election. There's actually numerous investigations. Uh, the Senate Select Committee is investigating. The, uh, the House Select Committee is investigating. There's several military committees that are looking at cybersecurity and at the Michael Flynn aspects of this. So there's numerous investigations that are going on at the same time. And occasionally, when you read in the news that something new was found, out, it's not necessarily found out by Mueller, but Mueller will eventually fi find out if it's come out through through some some other uh, outlet. So, for example, the recent uh, the recent discovery that the Senate Select Committee has uncovered that Russia did definitely interfere in the 2016 election. This is not a found, found finding that came from Mueller, or at least not that we know of, but it became publicized as part of the Senate investigation. But we're going to focus on Robert Mueller's investigation because that is the only investigation out of the whole lot which could result in criminal charges. So, a little bit of background. Uh for several decades before he became a political figure, Donald Trump was basically in bed with Russian oligarchs dealing with his, with his real estate businesses. And this is not just in terms of asking for loans. This is also Russians buying his real estate. Uh, uh, his commercial businesses, especially his real estate, had been faltering for uh, a great deal of the 90s, and he was essentially saved by very rich Russian people. This in itself is not outstanding. Uh, Russian oligarchs are very involved in the US real estate market. There is nothing particularly remarkable about their involvement with Trump, but it did become remarkable when he decided to run for public office. What does Putin want? So why would Russia even want to get involved with the US election? When Putin became president, he has a, he has a KGB slash GRU background. And when he came to, uh, to become the leader of Russia, he inherited a bunch of oligarchs back from the Yeltsin era. And he started off with those oligarchs kind of like in a live but let live situation, where he's like, you know, you guys do your thing. I'm not going to get involved. But at some point when he had amassed enough power, and he is now an incredibly powerful man in Russia and in the world, he started uh, adopting a more sort of tough perspective toward them. But he's still somewhat embarrassed by a lot of their, their dealings in the United States. And during the Obama era, when uh, um, all kinds of human rights abuses and things like that in Russia came to light, part of the sanctions that we uh, took against Russian nationals uh, involved freezing their assets in the United States. In a response to that, the Putin administration announced that they were going to stop adoptions of Russian children by US parents. If you guys are thinking, what's this got to do with anything? It, it all connects. Stay with me. This this is, this is one day, you know, 20 years from now, when all of this is a bad dream, I mean, not all of this is a bad dream, because we'll still have Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, but you know, when some of this is a bad dream, there will be a blockbuster movie about this, and every single piece of this is important. Okay, so at this point, the, the Russians decide that there will be no more adoptions of Russian children by US nationals. It all, it's also important to say Putin had a fairly good relationship with both Bushes, but he had a horrible relationship with Obama, and an even worse relationship with the Clintons. He especially hates Hillary, who in 2011, as Secretary of State, came on record saying, you know, we just hope that the elections in Russia are, you know, are honest, you know, we're concerned that there's not a free election there, and he really resented her for, uh, for that remark, and he's been, he's been harboring some pretty serious hatred for her uh, since then. 
Trump and Putin have actually been fairly friendly, and Trump has been trying to meet Putin for a long time, even before he ran for public office. One effort that we know he made that didn't come to fruition was during the Miss America, uh, the, sorry, the Miss Universe uh, contest in, in Russia, which, in which he was very much hoping to get to meet Putin, but that uh, did not uh, occur. When Trump decided to, uh, to run for office, he took as his campaign manager this man, Paul Manafort. Paul Manafort had been involved in American politics, but for the last decade or so, he's been working almost exclusively in the Ukraine. He has friends in the Ukraine, and he has uh, um, creditors in the Ukraine. In the Ukraine. He's, in, he's in pretty deep debt to some, uh, to some Ukrainians, and he's known them fairly well. What we now know is that during the campaign, um, Manafort had, uh, sorry, long before the campaign, Manafort had had all kinds of shady business in Ukraine which involved a great amount of money laundering to the tune of, of tens of millions of dollars, uh, which, which is hidden uh, with the help of Ukrainians and Ukrainian corporations. Him and his partner, Rick Gates, were doing a lot of this before the campaign, and he comes on top, he comes on board of the campaign already having these connections and having had many, many years of criminal activity. This I'm not hesitating to call cr criminal because, because Paul Manafort has been indicted for all of these money laundering and, and the indictment in its 31-page uh, glory tells you all the details, sums, you know, offshore banks that they use, the whole thing. He's actually now in jail for intimidating witnesses in, in his case. And we will hear a little bit more about him. Okay. So that's, that's Paul Manafort, just to kind of introduce you to some of the figures during the campaign. This is Donald Trump Jr. We know that during the campaign itself, the Trump administration had several dealings with the Russians. One of the most famous ones was a meeting at Trump Tower that uh, Trump Jr. and Manafort and uh, Jared Kushner took on June 9th of 2016. The, the meeting was supposed to have uh, a, a Russian government lawyer present. She was actually in the room, although the Russians say that she, they don't know her, they don't know if she's, if she's a government lawyer, and, and a bunch of other Russian officials of various calibers. It was organized by a music producer who reached out to Donald Trump Jr. and said, you want to meet with the Russians because they have information about Hillary that could be very useful to your father's campaign. Again, this we know for a fact. We then know that these people actually attended the meeting, and we then know that uh, Donald Trump Jr. and several other participants have testified that at the meeting, even though they expected to receive this information about uh, Clinton, they did not in fact receive it, and all the, the, the government lawyer wanted to talk about was the adoption mess. How we were going to sort out this issue with the Russian kids and the, the you know, prospective US adoptive parents and what we're going to do about this. So that in itself means that the meeting that was supposed to be very momentous, according to the testimony of Trump Jr. and Jared Kushner, was a non-event. But if it was a non-event, why have they been so cagey and trying to hide the fact that the meeting had occurred in the first place? So that's one thing. But this was not the only incident in which the Trump campaign reached out to Russians. This is George Papadopoulos, who was working as a foreign policy advisor on the Trump, the Trump campaign. We know that between March and September of 2016, Papadopoulos wrote, at least six emails to Russian nationals asking them for information that would paint Clinton in a, in, a, in a poor light. We also know that Manafort at the time had said, you know, we want to send someone low level, and Papadopoulos was fairly low level because we don't want Trump himself involved in that. So that's another thing that we know for a fact. Papadopoulos has been already convicted. He's already pled guilty to his part in what's going on. And he's actually cooperating with the Mueller investigation, telling them what he knows about the campaign. In addition to that, Michael Flynn, who was also part of the campaign and later uh, became uh, uh, Trump's advisor during the administration after Trump was, was confirmed, met up with Russian Ambassador Sergei Kislyak uh, it, at a couple of occasions. Now again, it, 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 just meeting with a Russian national in itself is not a criminal offense. This is not what we're talking about when we talk about obstruction of justice. But what we know is that Flynn lied about this meeting to Vice President Mike Pence. Pence had himself testified that he doesn't think it's such a big deal that Flynn had lied to him about this meeting. However, this again raises the issue, what, you know, what is going on? Now, the interesting thing is that the FBI started paying attention to what was going on here once they realized that Flynn had met with Kislyak. Because then they said, wait a minute. When Obama expelled all the Russian diplomats from the United States, Russia did not retaliate. What's going on here? And it is then that the FBI opened the investigation into the possible collusion with Russia. 
At around the same time that these meetings are taking place, uh, Russian nationals who work for a company called Cambridge Analytica start uh, basically creating false personas as US activists and infiltr infiltrate social media, specifically Facebook. Uh, I don't know, how many of you got a notice from Facebook that your accounts had been interfered with? So I don't... I, I, they seem to have targeted more people that could be swayed to the other side. It's just, just kind of like interesting to see, to see what the range is. I have some friends who reported that they got this message from Facebook. I did not, but, but, but many did. Essentially what the Russians did is they created these bots that pretend to be US activists and are trying to sway people to vote for Trump by accusing Clinton of meddling and of you know, security breaches such as the emails issue that we'll come to in a minute. Uh, 13 Russian nationals have been indicted for their involvement with American social media through, uh, through uh, Cambridge Analytica. We do not know if they're ever going to be actually on trial because if they're not here, odds that Russia is gonna extradite them here to, to stand trial are basically zero. Uh, but, but we know that they did this and we know that the Russian bots were active. Uh, by the way, we now know that there are Russian bots already active uh, anticipating the 2018 uh, midterms. So we know that the, yeah, this is, um, these are not necessarily people, people are programming them. It's, it's just, it's, it's basically cyber personalities pretending to be US citizens. Right now, the, they go with the hashtag walk away and they're trying to induce people to walk away from the Democratic Party. So this is, this is one of the things that came to light in just the last few days. Now, some of the revelations that came in through all of this digging also involved cyber hacks into Hillary Clinton's email server. She used a, a private server for some of her emails. They actually didn't hack her server specifically. They got emails of her through some correspondence between Anthony Weiner and one of Clinton's assistants, Huma Abedin, and that's how we learned about, about the fact that she used a private server. But the Russians did not actively come out with this as coming directly from them. They used an intermediary, so they used Julian Assange in WikiLeaks as a way to release the information. Now, following the release of this information, uh, F then FBI Director James Comey announced that they were opening an investigation against Hillary Clinton for the security breaches. This in itself made quite a dramatic impact on Clinton's odds of winning the presidency. This is a snapshot that I took from uh, 586 from Nate Silver's website just to show you kind of like what the, what the percentages were like. After about a week, uh, the Comey investigation announced that they could, you know, they, they found actually nothing too serious, there was nothing criminal, it was just a little bit of you know, administrative problems and they were closing the investigation. But then just a couple of weeks before the election, they reopened the investigation and announced it publicly. Comey has since then that he has uh, said basically, je ne regrette rien, you know, I just, you know, I balanced the costs and benefits and I did what I thought was, uh, was right. So this, this is his, his take on, on publishing the, the information that they had and we all know what happened eventually. Now, in January 2017, shortly after Trump is confirmed as president, uh, a brief by Christopher Steele called the Steele Memo gets leaked to Buzz BuzzFeed. Now, both the Republicans and the Democrats were paying Steele and other people to try and find out to what extent Russia was involved in the campaign. But the only fruitful investigation to come out of that was the investigation that the Democrats paid for. And so Steele issues this memo and people read all kinds of pretty fantastic and outlandish claims in the memo and basically just regard it as, foundless go as, as uh, foundationless gossip. So this is one of the most outlandish claims in the, in the Steele memo and the claim is that the Russians basically, they don't just kind of have Trump beholden to them uh, in terms of you know, gratitude or what have you. Trump is openly pro-Russian and was openly pro-Russian throughout his entire campaign, but that they're actually black blackmailing him because they have information on his nefarious activities in Russia, including one incident in which he uh, uh, booked into a hotel, specifically into a room in which the Obamas, whom he hates, had stayed, and asked for prostitutes to pee on the bed. Now, this part of the seal steel memo has not yet been verified. However, every day we find out that more and more facts from the steel memo are true, so people have now come to regard the steel memo as something that we're just kind of reading and we're sort of ticking every time that we find out that something, that something is true. That's where that's where the authority. If anybody wants to read more about Christopher Steele, who is a former British spy, former MI5 person, and want to find out why he did this memo and what were the implications, there's an excellent New Yorker story on him that came out uh, a couple of months ago. Okay, and then we came to the election. And what do we know about the election? Did the Russians actually hack our, our voting system and actually like falsely vote for Trump. We know that the Russians tried to attack 21 states and we know that they successfully attacked six. We do not know whether they could actually change the outcomes. We know they could access voter registration data. We now know from the Senate, uh, the Senate Select Committee 
that there definitely was some Russian interference, although we are as of yet clear of what that interference consisted of. So, so far, what, what we have verification for is that uh, public opinion in the United States was swayed by the activities of these Russians pretending posing as US nationals and by, you know, they're, they're basically cyber characters, they're little bots. We know that, uh, we know that they cyber hacked the uh, National Democratic Committee's uh, uh, paperwork and, and, and published the emails through, through Assange. And we know that six states were vulnerable to Russian attacks and were, and, and were actually attacked, but we do not know in what form. The next thing we know is that Je Jeff Sessions, uh, our attorney general, um, met with Sergei Kislyak, the same guy that Flynn met with. Uh, but he now claims that the meeting was completely innocent and they were, just, they were just talking. The thing is that when Sessions was being confirmed before the Senate, he denied having had that meeting take place. Or actually, he didn't deny, I'm sorry, he, he didn't mention that the meeting had taken place. Because of this, he has basically stepped out and recused himself from the Russia investigation. Trump still claims that he did not have to recuse himself. Their, their, their relationship kind of runs hot and cold, so, so we're unclear about what's going on there. But, uh, but Sessions has recused himself, and this is why it was his second in command, Ro Rod Rosenstein, who appointed previous FBI director Robert Mueller to head the investigation. So the, the, the Flynn-Russia issue becomes public, and Flynn actually resigns on February 13th. A day later, Trump meets up with James Comey and with Sessions, who is technically Comey's boss because he's the attorney general and Comey is the director of the FBI. And Trump asks Sessions to leave the room. What I'm telling you now is from James Comey's testimony before the Senate. Okay, he asks uh, Sessions to leave the room. Comey stays behind. And according to Comey, Trump then asks him, first of all, if he can count on his loyalty. There's a few meetings like that. He asks if he can count on his loyalty, which puts Comey in a very uncomfortable position as director of the FBI. And he also says, I hope you can find a way to let Flynn go. He's a good guy. You know, what, what are we going to do to take these Russia clouds off of me? You know, this is really weighing on me and, and yada, yada, yada. Uh, James Comey is very uh, discomfited by this conversation. Uh, and he apparently takes copious notes on these conversations with Trump. Uh, the next day, Comey is fired by Trump. Comey later comes to testify before, ten, uh, before, sent, before the Senate about all of these incidents, and he actually, uh, he, he remembers all of these. He brings the copious notes that he took at the time. Trump denies that the conversations ever took place. He says, uh, you know, one day the tapes are gonna reveal what happened. Comey says famously before the Senate, Lordy, I hope there are tapes. Uh, however, apparently Trump is now denying that there are tapes. So, so we, we have Comey's version for what happened, which is backed up by the memoranda that he wrote at the time, and we have a denial from Trump that uh, these meetings actually took place. So the question is essentially the same question that we asked in Watergate. So we've seen numerous contacts between the presidential campaign of Donald Trump and the Russians. We've seen efforts by a foreign power to take over the US. The Trump, uh, the Trump administration's official point is, you know, Russia did something very bad and intervened in the US election and that we have to investigate, but there's a complete denial that anything uh, untoward from their perspective took place. We know that this is not true. We know that several of them were actively involved with the Russians. What we don't know is what did the president know and when did he know it? And this is the key point, exactly the same as with Watergate, except this is you know, much worse for those of you who remember the previous one. If true, this is, this is much worse. Now, I should also point out another similarity to the Watergate scandal, which is that what is interesting here is not just the collusion itself, because the collusion itself is not, you know, if, if it's not fruitful and if the Russians are basically doing their thing, that in itself is not the, the dramatic issue. The dramatic issue is the efforts to cover up what happened. The lies, you know, the repeated people who are denying having taken meetings that they did, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Because some of you may recall this lady. Her name is Stormy Daniels. Uh, uh, Stormy, this is probably the first time anybody's talked at UCSF about Stormy Daniels with a big slide. Stormy Daniels is an adult film actress who in 2006 had an affair with Donald Trump and received $130,000 in hush money from his attorney slash fixer, Michael Cohen. Why is this even important? It's, you know, it's salacious and interesting, but that's not the point. The point is that Trump had initially completely denied having had the affair or paid her any money whatsoever. Michael Cohen, his attorney, had paid her the one 
$130,000, and we know that he did it, and we actually know, surprisingly from Rudy Giuliani, who's now also legally advising the president, that the president paid him back for it. <laughs> now, but the bottom line is that when the FBI started investigating Michael Cohen, they raided his house. In the course of raiding his house, they found something. We don't know at this point what it was. We have some suspicions. People who know Michael Cohen know that he is a, um, compulsive taper of phone calls. And one of the things that people are thinking is that he might have tapes of his conversations with Trump. We know that this is not the first time he's paid various women for Trump to silence them about various affairs that we've had. But what we're now wondering is were all these payments related to these salacious affairs or are they payments for something else? We know that Michael Cohen has now left the Trump ship and he's now holding onto the Mueller raft and he's cooperating with the Mueller investigation and we will see what happens. So a little bit about uh, the Mueller investigation. As I mentioned before, the Mueller investigation is the only of the five or six investigations that are going on that could actually yield criminal charges. Mueller is a special prosecutor. He is using a grand jury to collect the information. I'll explain a little bit about a grand jury in a moment. Uh, and this is why he's a pretty important guy. He's a Republican, was the FBI director for a very long time. And until uh, the uh, huge campaign of discreditation that the Trump campaign is leading against him, he was very widely respected uh, on both sides of the aisle. And his investigation has actually yielded some indictments. What you're seeing here is the indictment against Manafort and Gates for the money laundering and the Ukrainians. The Trump campaign says this has nothing to do with us. All of the things in this actually quite, quite scary uh, indictment have nothing to do with the campaign. This is all things that happened before the campaign, which is true. However, it shows that this person is deeply in bed with the Ukrainians and deeply indebted to them coming into his job on the campaign in a very rapidly pro-Russia uh, 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 purportive administration. So this is one indictment that's come up. We know that Papadopoulos has an indictment against him and he's already pled guilty. We know that Michael Flynn's been indicted and pled guilty. And we know that there's already also the indictment against the 13 nationals that were involved in trying to sway public opinion uh, uh, entering into the 2016 election. Let me try and explain why this is taking a long time and why it's likely to be more of a marathon and not a sprint. So the grand jury is basically one of three mechanisms that we use in the United States to sort of pause between the part in which there's cases arising from police investigation toward charges, charged cases. In that respect, this investigation is not different from any criminal felony case in the United States. Right, the police gathers evidence against somebody, right? They give it to the prosecution, and the prosecutors, who are uh, a separate but equally important group, uh, as our friends in law and order often tell us, they have to make a decision whether to charge or not. This is the first kind of type of review over the cases. So not every case that the police investigates is going to actually end up in pressing charges. Then there's two additional mechanisms. One of them is that the prosecutor uses the grand jury and the grand jury has to decide to indict or to dismiss the case. And then there's also a preliminary hearing before a judge which has to find whether there are, there's probable cause to proceed with the case. Now. This means that there's actually an interesting relationship between the three players that are involved in the grand jury investigation, the court, the prosecutor, and the grand jury. The court's role in all of this is fairly nominal. Basically what the court is doing is it's just issuing subpoenas for people. Basically that's the, that's the thing that you use to make sure that people actually show up to testify before the grand jury and, because if they don't they can be filed for contempt and they can, they can go to jail. So, so this is what the court does. But of all these three players, the party that really sort of puppeteers the whole situation is the prosecutor. Now grand juries, both in the federal system and in various states, they can decide to investigate things on their own accord. They can decide who to bring, but invariably they don't do any of this. Invariably the prosecutor basically puppeteers the entire process. The prosecutor brings an issue to the attention of the grand jury. The prosecutor tells them who he thinks or she thinks that they should look at. And the prosecutor can also decide which evidence to put before the grand jury. One important thing to know about grand jury investigations is that prosecutors are under no obligation to provide exculpatory evidence to the jury. So even if in the course of the investigation there's evidence that's favorable to the defendant, 
isn't, the jury is not going to hear it at this stage. And that is because the only thing the jury has to decide is they don't decide whether to convict somebody or not, if they're guilty or not. They only have to decide if there's enough. And enough is probable cause. Now, probable cause is not 50%. It's not more likely than not. It's, I would say, to a scientific audience, kind of like think 30%, 35% sure that there's like something fishy going on. That's really all you need to proceed with a prosecution. It is only later a trial that the prosecution will have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? So this is, this is the way, in general, grand jury investigations go. Now, the grand jury has this dual role. On one hand, they're an investigatory tool because you know witnesses come before the grand jury and they testify, so it's a very effective method to get information to come in, sometimes information that you couldn't get through the police or through the FBI. But they also act as a shield because they're supposed to kind of like stop the prosecutor from you know unfounded prosecutions against people. Practically, this part almost never happens. And what we typically see is that if the prosecutor wants to indict somebody, the grand jury is going to indict them. There's this you know saying that the you know the grand jury will indict a ham sandwich if the prosecutor tells them. And this is exactly what happens in pretty much all investigations. So the concern is, you know, are we going through with something that's ill-founded? In this particular case, this concern is pretty much zero. And this is why. This is because the stakes here are incredibly high. Mueller is not going to take a chance and indict anyone unless he is 100% sure that he, he can go to trial and he can obtain a conviction. Because the national embarrassment that is going to ensue of indicting somebody in something of these high stakes and the case ending in an acquittal is going to be enormous. So every time you see something coming out of this investigation, like there's an actual indictment, you can be pretty much sure that they've checked everything they possibly could. He is not going to keep exculpatory evidence from the jury because it's taking a huge risk, and, uh, and he's going to really watch what, uh, what he does, which is why you can be sure that anything that ends in an indictment is fact. You can also be sure that what I told you here is just a small tip of the iceberg of what the Mueller investigation knows at the level of probable cause, and the only reason we don't know more, for example, about what the Russians actually did to our voting in 2016 is because they're not 100% sure yet. But it doesn't mean that they don't already have positive confirmation of more parts of the Mueller memo. So uh, this is it for my part, and I'm going to move it over to my colleague, Joel Paul, who's going to talk about the constitutional issues. The Constitution really establishes for us a kind of equilibrium between the three branches of government, the judiciary, the executive, and the Congress. And when one of those three branches oversteps their authority uh, to interfere with another branch's authority, we have a constitutional crisis. Right now, we are on the brink of a constitutional crisis. Not for the first time in our history, we've had constitutional crises going back to Jefferson, but it is a constitutional crisis, and it is going to fall on the Supreme Court to decide how to, uh, to what extent to circumscribe the authority of the president uh, in this situation. So I, I want to talk about five issues very briefly, and obviously these are very complica complex issues in which there's a very rich literature uh, of, of, a, of a legal scholarship, but I'm going to try to sort of give you a kind of uh, a thumbnail sketch of what those five uh, issues are. Um, the first issue here is really about the abuse of the president's authority uh, to use his pardon power. Uh, he seems to like to write pardons, and pardons, of course, could be used in a way which could effectively uh, uh, sidetrack uh, the whole investigation uh, by pardoning all those people who might otherwise offer testimony against him. He could pardon uh, his aides, he could pardon his family, he can potentially even pardon himself. So we're going to talk first about the limits on the pardon power. The second issue that I want to address is whether the president himself uh, can be indicted uh, or prosecuted. There's some question about that uh, issue and whether it might be necessary first for the president to be impeached before he could be indicted uh, or prosecuted, uh, indicted and prosecuted. Um, the third issue I want to talk about is uh, perhaps the most uh, 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 
the most impending issue, uh, and that is the question as to whether the president has to respond to a subpoena. As many of you probably know, um, this past week, the president's attorneys um, suggested that um, uh, they uh, would not uh, come in to voluntarily speak to the uh, special prosecutor. Uh, unless they were convinced by the special prosecutor that the president was actually guilty of a crime, which is a strange standard uh, to apply. So uh, what um, uh, the question becomes then is if, if the president doesn't voluntarily come in to answer the questions of the special prosecutor, well, uh, can the special prosecutor go to the grand jury and get a subpoena, and must the president respond to that subpoena? Uh, the fourth issue here is the question about how we could remove uh, this guy from office if it comes to that. Um, and we'll talk very briefly about uh, the impeachment authority. Uh, and finally, the fifth issue I want to talk about is whether and how um, uh, the president might potentially fire um, uh, the special counsel if that is possible. So um, beginning with the first issue here about the limitations on the pardon power. Uh, the Constitution uh, sets out that the president has the authority to grant pardons. And it doesn't actually explicitly limit pardons, uh, except to the extent uh, that it provides that the president cannot uh, issue a pardon uh, in cases of impeachment. What this means is that the president potentially could offer pardons uh, to all of his uh, aides, uh, all of the people in the Trump organization, members of his family, uh, who may otherwise be subject to some kind of uh, criminal investigation or prosecution. And he doesn't have to wait uh, until the indictment or the, pro or the uh, conviction. Uh, he can offer the pardon in advance. The pardons can operate prospectively. Uh, this, of course, opens the possibility that the president can abuse his pardon power. Uh, it, it is a way in which the president could, for example, uh, prevent uh, uh, Paul Manafort from uh, uh, having to testify uh, or having to uh, go through a trial, in any case, uh, in which he might te otherwise testify. But the, the, the key here is that there's a risk to the president. If the president offers a pardon to Mr. Manafort or who offers a pardon to uh, his uh, son-in-law or his son, uh, those individuals can no longer invoke their Fifth Amendment uh, rights against self-incrimination. Uh, once you're, you can't be subject to a trial, uh, then uh, you can't claim that by testifying you might subject yourself to criminal liability. And so in a sense, the reason that the president is perhaps holding off offering a pardon at the moment to people like Mr. Manafort is precisely because he wants to keep them quiet. Uh, he wants to give them the right to invoke uh, their Fifth Amendment privileges, at least up until the moment of their conviction. After they're convicted, then presumably he could, in fact, offer a pardon. I'm going to ask you to hold questions just so that I can get through the, all the material, and then I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, there are um, two limitations here, in addition to the limitation on the president's impeachment, uh, that is to say the president can't offer a pardon against an impeachment, um, the, uh, either of himself or of another um, uh, uh, individual in the government. Uh, and those limitations are, first of all, that the pardon does not operate as against state law. So what you see is uh, the Attorney General in New York State is investigating uh, uh, the President and other people uh, connected with the Trump Organization at the moment. If that leads to an indictment or a conviction in New York State, um, those cannot be pardoned. Those aren't subject to a pardon. So the President may have to face uh, uh, some sort of uh, trial uh, in New York State or in other states, wherever um, uh, prosecutors uh, may seek to uh, indict him. And the other limitation here is uh, a more controversial one, but most legal authorities would agree that the president cannot pardon himself. Uh, even Richard Nixon, at the height of Watergate, uh, considered for a moment whether he could pardon himself. And even Richard Nixon, uh, who uh, you know was no shrinking uh, violet when it came to author, uh, uh, it, uh, expanding his uh, presidential authority, Richard Nixon just determined that he could not pardon himself. And the reason for that is clear: that that there is an implicit principle in our Constitution that you cannot be a judge in your own case, uh, and no man is above the law, and, and therefore. The 
the president, while he can pardon his family, he can pardon his wife, he can pardon his children, he cannot pardon himself. So those are the limitations on the pardon power. Uh, as uh, James Madison suggested uh, in the Constitutional Convention, uh, if the president has abused his pardon power, then the appropriate remedy is impeachment. The second issue I want to talk about is whether the president uh, can be indicted and prosecuted. Uh, and this issue uh, is a very controversial issue at the moment, uh, and one in which um, the legal community is divided. Um, the Constitution doesn't actually provide in its text for any immunities for the president. Uh, it certainly doesn't provide any criminal immunities. Um, it's clear that the president can be indicted after he leaves office. The Constitution's text uh, even provides uh, that uh, after that, um, um, uh, once a party is convicted of impeachment, uh, they shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. So there's no question that once the president leaves office or once the president has been impeached, uh, he can be subject uh, to an indictment and a prosecution. But the question then is whether or not he, can, he has to actually go through the impeachment or has to leave office first before an indictment or impeachment can occur. The provision in the Constitution that applies to impeachment uh, does not make a distinction between uh, the President of the United States and other federal uh, civil officers or judges. That is to say, all federal civil officers, that is to say, as opposed to military officers, uh, and all federal judges and the President are all subject to the same impeachment process. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, at least three federal judges have been uh, indicted and convicted uh, and punished while sitting as judges, as federal judges, which suggests that there is no immunity for uh, federal officers, that it isn't necessary for federal officers to be impeached before they can be indicted and convicted. And uh, there's also some evidence as to what the framers of the Constitution thought about this. Um, uh, the, uh, the framers in the Constitutional Convention did not uh, directly address the question as to whether uh, a president uh, or any other federal officer could be indicted before impeachment. But um, uh, the first Congress of the United States, uh, in adopting the first uh, Federal uh, Criminal Act, the Act of 1790, um, specifically provided that sitting federal judges could be uh, indicted and convicted uh, if they engaged in bribery. Uh, that is to say that the first Congress of the United States thought that it was not necessary to impeach a judge in order for the judge to be subjected to a criminal proceeding. Now, what is the relevance of that? Well, most of the men who sat in the first Congress were also the men who were involved in both drafting and ratifying the Constitution. So that's a pretty representative uh, group of people if you want to know what was the intention behind the Constitution's provisions with regard to impeachment. But one could make the argument here that a, a president is different from a judge. Uh, that, it, that you know, we can, we can get rid of judges, judges are a dime a dozen, there's always another judge, but the president uh, is the one person who represents the executive branch of government. Uh, and, and the argument is that the president is just too important, that he's, uh, he's a really busy guy, he doesn't have time to be prosecuted. Um, prosecutions take a lot of time and trouble, and, and we shouldn't want to distract the president, that instead we should have a nice impeachment, and then after his impeachment he can be tried and, 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 and subjected to, to punishment. Um, that is the argument which was essentially rejected in the Clinton versus Jones case. That's the argument that the president is too busy. Um, the Clinton versus Jones case is the case that many of you know arose when Paula Jones claimed 
uh, that she uh, had been uh, uh, had suffered emotional abuse uh, uh, by President Clinton. Um, President Clinton uh, was then uh, called uh, to testify in, in that case. Um, uh, a subpoena was issued. The question before the court was whether or not the president could be subjected to a civil a civil proceeding. And in that case, the judge said. Uh, the Supreme Court, I'm sorry, said unanimously that the president's claim that he was too busy to be subjected to a civil trial just doesn't hold any weight. Uh, that that the demands of justice are such that the president must uh, participate, must answer to a court. Uh, so, Afashiori, uh, if the president can be subjected to a civil uh, 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 proceeding in which there's much less of a public interest at stake, surely he can be subjected to a criminal proceeding in which there is a much larger uh, uh, and more viable uh, criminal uh, public interest uh, uh, I I implicated. Um, <clears throat> the third issue here is whether the president can be subjected to it, it must respond to a subpoena. And um, going back um, to Thomas Jefferson, uh, Thomas Jefferson was the first president who was served with a subpoena by um, uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, who coincidentally is the subject of my fabulous new book that you should all run out and buy immediately without precedent. But J uh, Chief Justice John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall did not hesitate to issue a subpoena uh, to President uh, uh, Jefferson uh, in the Aaron Burr treason trial. Uh, and uh, and uh, Jefferson um, did not deny that the president must respond to a subpoena. He instead asserted a right of executive privilege. Um, but he wasn't really confident enough that he had an actual right of executive privilege, because this was a new idea that he had just come up with. So the president then voluntarily answered the subpoena by submitting all the documents that were required. Um, similarly, uh, Nixon, uh, of course, was subjected famously to a subpoena in the Nixon tapes case. And the Supreme Court of the United States unanimously held that the president has no absolute or unqualified immunity um, from a subpoena. Um, the court allowed in that case that there might be situations where, for example, there's a, a military uh, questions uh, that, that the president might be able to uh, prevent uh, or, or, or withhold documents. Um, but they said that the fundamental demands of due process of law and the fair administration of justice trumped the president's claims of executive privilege in that case. In this instance, Whatever else Trump's attorneys may assert, there is no possibility of executive privilege because the alleged activities that took place were activities that took place before he was even president. And these are crimes which occurred before he became president. And the only thing that may have occurred while he was president would have been a cover-up or uh, some attempt to obstruct justice. So. Um, uh, that case suggests to us that a president uh, can, in fact, uh, it must, in fact, respond uh, to a subpoena. And if, therefore, the president's attorneys refuse uh, to allow the president to voluntarily appear before the special prosecutor, it seems very likely that a subpoena will issue, and I'm sure that case will go up to the Supreme Court, and a great deal will hinge, then, on um, whomever the new member of the Supreme Court may be. <clears throat> uh, uh, there is some discussion, I should say, in the press, and I have contributed to it, uh, about the fact that um, uh, the president's nominee uh, wrote a law review article some years back in which he suggested that presidents should not have to participate in criminal uh, proceedings and should not have to answer to subpoenas. But he doesn't assert in that article, importantly, he doesn't assert in that article that it's a constitutional immunity. Uh, what uh, instead, um, Mr. Kavanaugh asserts, is that the Congress of the United States should adopt a statute that would immunize the president from having to participate in civil or criminal proceedings. The fourth issue here, which I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about at any length, is how and whether the president can be removed from office. Uh, basically, um, the standard for the removal of the president is whether he commits uh, a treason, um, which arguably uh, some would say he has or may have or his aides have, or whether he has committed a high crime or misdemeanor. 
those are terms which have been sort of very vague and purposefully vague uh, in the Constitution. The experience uh, from the very beginning of our republic has been that Congress has defined the crimes that, are, uh, that trigger uh, impeachment uh, very broadly. Uh, the first person to be impeached was uh, New Hampshire uh, Judge John Pickering um, uh, in 1803, and he was impeached for drunkenness, um, which is not a high crime or misdemeanor per se, um, but Congress, uh, the Senate thought that it was, and uh, Congress thought that it was, and Justice Samuel Bacon Face Chase. Um, Bacon Face was his nickname. Um, that's another story. Uh, in 1803, uh, he was uh, uh, he was uh, impeached uh, for his public statements. So the, the the definition here of high crimes and misdemeanors is sufficiently elastic that surely it could reach whatever charges uh, may uh, come up. Uh, and um, finally, the question about whether the president can fire. Um, uh, Special Counsel Mueller. Uh, very briefly, um, the uh, appointment of Mueller, by, as you know, by acting uh, Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was made under two different provisions, which makes it a little complicated. He was appointed under the general statute that establishes the Department of Justice, which authorizes the Department of Justice to go out and hire attorneys to investigate crimes. That's what they do. Um, so he was appointed under that statute, but he was also appointed, importantly, under a set of regulations issued by Janet Reno during the Clinton administration, which are known as the Reno Rules. I like that. The Reno Rules uh, provide that the special counsel can only uh, be removed for cause, in other words. If the president or if uh, Rod Rosenstein or anyone else wanted to remove Mueller, they would have to show that he had actually engaged in some kind of malfeasance. Uh, he could not simply be removed because they don't like the color of his tie uh, or his politics. Um, in a case called Morrison versus uh, Olson, the Supreme Court of the United States, by a vote of seven to one, uh, held that uh, uh, Congress could authorize the uh, appointments of special counsels to investigate the executive branch. Uh, recently, I think yesterday, the president uh, 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 tweeted that he thought that the appointment of Mueller was unconstitutional, a word he may have just learned recently. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, in any event, um, uh, if he wanted to fire Mueller, even if he could show cause for firing Mueller, uh, he cannot do so directly because the Supreme Court has said that you can, the president can only fire those individuals that he has personally appointed. He did not appoint Mueller. Mueller was appointed by Rod Rosenstein. Only Rod Rosenstein can fire Mueller. If he wanted to fire Rod Rosenstein, if he wanted to fire Mueller, he would first have to fire Rod Rosenstein, in which case uh, the authority would then pass to the next ranking member of the Department of Justice, who is the Associate Attorney General. And uh, uh, I have it on some authority that the Associate Attorney General would refuse to fire Mueller, so he would have to be fired, and then he would have to fire the, the uh, uh, Solicitor General of the United States, and then he would have to fire each and every one of the Assistant Attorney Generals until he got to the most recently appointed and confirmed confirmed Assistant Attorney General, who was appointed just yesterday, Brian uh, Benchkowski, who some of you may have heard of in the press recently. Uh, Brian Benchkowski <clears throat> was just appointed to be the Assistant uh, Attorney General for the Department for the Criminal Division of Justice Department. Uh, he has never been in a courtroom in his life, so this might be a great opportunity for him to do so. <laughs> his principal legal experience prior to this uh, may be valuable to him, however. He worked for the Alpha Bank, which is a Russian-owned bank that is being investigated by, you guessed it, Mueller. <laughs> All of these questions ultimately depends on the strength of our constitutional culture. And the question for the court, the question for all of us is whether or not our cultural, the culture of constitutionalism in our country is strong enough uh, to prevent uh, the abuse of power. Thank you. Okay, so um, please um, let's thank um, Professor Avaram and Professor Paul for their fantastic <laughs> sessions.
Thanks. My name is Ann Harvey, and I've got a question about the subpoena power and the pardons and um, and Nixon versus the United States. That was unanimous decision. Was that the appeal of Judge Sirica's order that Nixon turned over the tapes? Was there a written opinion? In this, by the Supreme Court? Yes. Yes, yes, yes there's a written opinion. And was yeah. it by? It's unanimous. Okay, by people occurring on the court too? I'm sorry, Is it, the, are those justices still in the court? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of, well, uh, well. Okay, so uh, sorry to size supplies, though. No, no, no. They're all gone. They're all gone. Oh, okay, thank you. But uh, the precedent is still there. My name is Lucy Johns. Um, I want to go back to your statement about the six states where we know for sure that there was Russian interference. Can you characterize the voting systems in those states that might have made them especially vulnerable, and then comment about whether those characteristics uh, are found in other states, but we just don't know about the Russian interference yet? Well, the answer is, is I'm not sure. And even looking at the 24 state list that they tried to attack, they're very, very different states politically from each other. Um, and, and again, the fact that we know that they tried to attack 21 states doesn't mean that they didn't try to attack other states that we don't know about. This is just the, the kind of the evidence that we know. But there, I, I'm not sure that until, uh, there are committees about, on cybersecurity that are trying to investigate specifically this question to try to see if, if our voting system is, like if there are aspects of it that are vulnerable. And until they reach conclusions, I don't think we'll be able to know. What we do know for sure is that some of the intervention was through kind of through dumping this information about the emails and through all the social media swaying, and that, of course, applied to people of all states. Hi, my name's Mary Norton, and I have a quick question. You mentioned, and we hear mentioned all the time, is this a constitutional crisis? And you said yes. Is there a definition of what constitutes a constitutional crisis? Sure. Well, as I suggested, I, it's, it, I think we're on the brink of a constitutional crisis. The constitutional crisis occurs uh, if the president refuses a subpoena, for example, uh, or if the president uh, um, uh, attempts to pardon himself. Um, those actions which are clearly in excess of his authority then would presumably uh, have to be answered by the Supreme Court. I mean, one question you might ask yourselves, one question that I always raise with my students in constitutional law is, why is it that Nixon turned over the tapes? I mean, how are they gonna get the tapes out of his hands? They weren't gonna come over and arrest him. They weren't gonna send the police to search through the White House for the tapes, right? He, he turned over the tapes because the constitutional structure is, our constitutional culture is so strong that his own legitimacy was at stake. And so what happens in a constitutional crisis is that the, the legitimacy of the presidency would be at stake at that point. And hopefully at that point, the court would assert itself. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have. I think we're going to lose the room. But if you have more questions, I'm sure you can come and ask our uh, panelists, and they'll, they'll answer. Them.